I believe we have uh, Chef Jenny who will do a presentation for us now. And I, uh, I read her bio yesterday, but I'm going to read it again because she's so awesome. So, Chef Jenny was raised in northern Saskatchewan by a little lake where she spent time berry picking, cooking, and baking with the bounty of the forest, and where she dreamed of one day of opening a fancy restaurant. Her first food business was a hamburger stand called Flight Delight at La Range Airport, where she operated with two friends the summer before grade nine. She expanded her horizons and tasted Canadian fine cuisine while working for several years in the Rocky Mountains. In 2005, Jenny opened a new ground cafe in the small farming community of Birch Hills, where she took on the role of chef, owner, hostess, and server. After eight years of restaurant life, Jenny became the chef in residence at the Saskatoon Farmer's Market, where she found new and exciting recipes to highlight vendor products. In 2019, Jenny closed the catering arm of her business to become the first female and Métis executive chef at Wanuskewin Heritage Park, where she is still involved as a culinary consultant and chef. So we've all been tasting her delicious food. Now let us feast of her mind. Chef Jenny. Thank you, Jordan. Um, when my grandma would call us to the table, I was just thinking of the name of this gathering, Come to the Table. And she had eight kids and 32 grandkids, and we would all meet at her tiny little house on 20th Street West in Prince Albert. And she would, I'm going to stand back from the mic because I don't want to hurt your ears. She would say, Dinner! And we would all come running from the basement, from outside, from the fire, wherever we were. So that's how we were called to the table when we were at my grandma's house. Um, I didn't really give a chance to introduce myself fully yesterday. Um, my name is Jenny Lassard, and the Lassard part comes from my dad's side. But my mating names are Bird, Halcro, Campbell, Knight, Hallett. So that's the Scottish English and a lot of people are very confused when they hear that. They assume that the French part is the Métis part, but that's how we all got <laughs> to be such a diverse nation, and that's how Machif ended up with some Scot, a little bit of Scottish, Cree, English. Um, so my family came through the Red River Valley, and then I didn't even know this until last year when I, I moved to the Capel Valley and just felt at home. I grew up in the bush. I thought that's where I was kind of from and part of me was, but just feeling at home there and realizing that that's where actually my um, last person to receive script was actually from the Capel Valley. So it, I feel like I'm kind of at home now, but I've lived and worked all across Saskatchewan. Um, you can start the presentation. Yeah. I'm not going to look at it yet, though, because there's a few things I want to tell you before I get distracted by photos of food. <laughs> so I was born in Prince Albert. How many of you were born in PA? A couple of you? Meadow Lake? Yeah. Um, and then when I was two months old, my family moved to Besnard Lake, and they brought me, which was nice. And my, <laughs> my dad was a scaler with Prince Albert pulp and paper. So he was the guy that measured all the piles of trees so the guys could get paid. And we lived in, uh, in a trailer. There was two other families. There was um, a Norwegian family with two little boys our age. And then there was a family, the Bradfields, that those kids mostly spoke Cree. So there was Norwegian kids. And Cree kids and us and we all the six of us just ran around and played and it's an eagle sanctuary so there were a lot of eagles always flying over top of us so I feel really blessed to have been raised there and then when my sister was school age we moved north of La Ronge. it's now called Lamp Lake so that's where I grew up we didn't have tv we didn't have a phone until I was in grade five you had to call the operator and be like this is JK3266 I'd like to call whatever so for something to do Basically, I, I cooked and picked things, and I remember I'd always ask my mom, is this edible? And she'd be like, yeah. And, <laughs> and anywhere, anytime I was visiting anywhere, I would ask about the plants. And my first kind of teachings about plants was around the rose hips. So there was a wonderful lady named Damar Helkett. We went to her cabin for, for tea on the trap line, and she told me about how to harvest rose hips after the frost. They're sweeter, they're softer. And she told me some other, quite a few other things. So I was four and a half years old, and I, I remember that. 
So I'd just like to tell you, in case you don't hear it often enough, that the things we say to the little ones and the teachings we give them and the encouragement we give them, they remember. And my first grade teacher, Miss Siemens, actually came from further south, but she would take us on walks. And I still have this little book from grade one, 1981, in pre-cam elementary school called Plants of Northern Saskatchewan, edible plants of Northern Saskatchewan. And it's, we made dandelion root coffee and we drank it and we dried some fish. We had some elders come in. That was in grade one. So it's just incredible the impact you can make. And I remember everybody trying this dandelion coffee and some people spit it out. They didn't like it right away. And she told us, just keep trying things. Your taste buds are growing just like you are. So I think it's important too with kids to you know, we call we say picky eaters, and I've even encountered a lot of adults that say, I'm a picky eater, and I think sometimes we don't understand that can come from trauma. That can come from being, you know, having stress when you're eating, or, oh, what if I don't finish it? Am I going to get in trouble? So there's so many different ways we can, you know, navigate that, how am I going to get them to eat it piece? Okay, let's start the... Start the oh, the reason I'm wearing this is I'm part of the um, Indigenous Culinary of Associated Nations. So, um, and I kind of, I don't say I represent the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, but I'm kind of the Métis voice on that board. And it was started in uh, 2018 by Joseph Shawana from Manitoulin Island. And it's kind of underneath the um, Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. So people are always now wanting to find out how they can get you know, chefs to partner with communities, media, of course, now wants to know a lot of stuff about Indigenous cuisine. And it's not super simple, right? Like, if someone calls, and this happens all the time, we just want a, one or two recipes, no problem. Are they not my recipes? A lot of them, they're community recipes. I'm not going to give Colleen Hamilton's duck soup recipe to the New York Times and then just have everybody make it willy-nilly. Like, there's some responsibility that goes with these recipes that have been developed over years and years. So we do some of that. We, um, we're just about to get go really hard into the whole, and I caught the tail end of Scott's amazing presentation, thank you so much, about the wild meat piece and how to, how to get that into the, into the mix too, a little bit easier. So Joseph's mother made these for us at the beginning of COVID, Janet Trudeau. Um, all right, we can, oh, I can do it. Oh, I'm such a diva. Somebody please click my slide. <laughs> Food tastes better outside. Do we all agree? Yeah. So that's us eating burnt hot dogs at Besnard Lake. Just that was our transportation. Is remember getting out of there and burping skidoo gas for half the day. Um, just kind of showing you. So we can eat all this too, hey? Like all this moss is edible. The reindeer moss, the sphagnum. That's just walking around. Um, so where I live now, I have choke cherries and cactus and snakes. And where I grew up, I had bears and blueberries and cranberries. So Saskatchewan is so diverse. And I think, where's the furthest south your schools would be? Those of you that are here. Well, so there's Aiden Bowman's here, right? Yeah, so you have Saskatoon's, choke cherries. There's, we, but we're representing probably three different ecosystems in this room here, the parkland, boreal, forest, and Precambrian shield. So aren't we just so blessed with the riches of this land? We're just going to look at some plant nations here. Lowbush cranberries. Do we have any berry pickers here? Have you ever picked with a headlamp deep into the night because you just couldn't leave? <laughs> um, my first job was uh, when I was in... So I was 14, some friends and I rented the um, food truck from the Kiganak Friendship Centre in Larange, and we went out to the airport because there was no food out there. There was just a vending machine. And someone had said, hey, that would be a good business opportunity. So we got like $1,000 from Canada Manpower, as it was called then. And we served chips and pop and burgers and coffee and something, baking at this little trailer. Um, and that's when I realized that, oh, I, I love cooking. I've always loved to cook, but I can actually make money. We made enough money to buy our school clothing at the end of that summer. So another thing I wanted to mention is, like, kids are so smart, and they have access to, like, I had to call my grandma for a recipe, and 
that was expensive. Like once we did get a phone, you didn't call unless it was Thursday night after nine, basically. But these kids can go onto the Food Network. They can go onto YouTube. They can find so many things. And with your amazing instruction, with your commercial cooking, if we can get them small amounts of funds to start small summer food businesses, which would be another way, too, to continue. Like one problem, I don't know if it's a problem, but you plant a school garden, but then everybody goes on holidays. Like, what do you do with all that? Like, the root vegetables will be fine, so maybe you could even partner with some of the high schoolers who have a little food truck and then can use and maintain, look after those gardens, use the fresh stuff, and then you'll, they can make sure your root crops are weeded. I just had that idea this morning at, like, 5.30. But, um, and then my second job was with the playground program for the LaRange Recreation Department. And we planned all these crazy activities for kids. We thought they'd love them, and they didn't. So then we asked them, like, what do you want to do? And they wanted to go berry picking. So we called two big suburban cabs, which I don't think you could do in this day and age, 15-year-olds taking a bunch of youngsters out berry picking. And for the rest of the summer, we picked berries, and we went to the beach and swam. So kids, it's one thing to eat this amazing local food, but be out there harvesting it. Like those of you who go in the bush and berry pick, that's half the the heart part of it and the nourishment is being out there. And so my dream is to somehow have a program in the city where we can take kids out, just harvest things, and then they can take it home to their families. We can prepare some things. There's probably people doing that. I'm sure there is. Whenever we have an idea, there's either a thousand people that would jump on board and help us or someone's already doing it. Um, Rose petals, I love to harvest rose petals for syrup. They're so full of vitamin C. Sometimes I just eat them. This summer, the roses didn't want me to pick them. Every time I went to harvest, they would bite me, and there was a couple of in. So the, the plants, I think, will tell you when they want to be picked. We need to respect that. Um, rose hips. So the, the, the applesauce in the breakfast, I harvested those rose hips just before the snow out at Lumsden. And then I, um, of course, we don't want to eat the seeds of those, that plant. So I cooked it down, made a paste that looks almost like tomato paste. It's crazy. And it was interesting. I was doing a presentation to some kids last fall, and one of the kids had gone picking rose hips, and he said, can I tell you something? And I was like, yeah, of course. And he said, one rose hip by itself, you can barely smell it. But when you put it in a bowl with a bunch of other rose hips, it smells amazing. And that's like people. I was like, oh my goodness, I just got a teaching from this little, <laughs> this little eight-year-old. So it has a kind of a, like a tomatoey, fruity, beautiful smell. And I use it in tomato sauces too. So I use it in a, just add a few extra tomatoes and it's gorgeous. You can freeze that puree and it's just like vitamin C heaven in there. Oh, it's amazing. And we didn't sweeten that applesauce at all. There we go. Oh, I don't know why that's in here, but I might as well tell you about it. So <laughs> when I was 16, my parents got divorced. I went to Jasper to live with my mom. And then basically all I did for the next five years was work three jobs and eat and cook. Not professionally, but I just cooked and ate and worked. So that's a beautiful little fancy food. I was in the 90s. I was all the rage to put things on forks and spoons. And then I got married, super young, well, 21. Had a kid, have two now. Um, and we were living in Jasper. It was kind of expensive, and our family wasn't there. So we moved back, and I was working as a freelance writer and needed to make more money. I had these two little kids. I mean, it was to the point where sometimes I would pick bottles and, you know, to buy the baby wipes. It's not... You'd be waiting. I had a soup that I called child tax check soup, so I'd make it like the day before the... I mean, it's kind of funny, but it isn't, right? Because like it, it sucks to be not eating as much food as you should because you want to save it for your kids. But I actually made a soup and recipe it, and it uses like the bottom half of a ragu container and celery and carrots and lentils. But anyway, I didn't start a restaurant because I had this great dream of starting a restaurant with two little kids. I needed money, and that was, those were my skills that I could do that. So I started out first by going to the farmer's market in PA, just selling soup and bannock and coffee with my mom, my baby on, one of my babies on my back, and kind of got people used to my, my food by having them see me there. 
Would not be funny if it was my mom. Um, <laughs> it wasn't. And then, um, so we moved to Birch Hills, which is near Muscaday, First Nation, kind of in between Muscaday, James Smith, Malfort, Prince Albert. And I rented a little 14-seat coffee shop. So there was enough, like, I could reach the cash drawer and the sink, basically. So it was tiny, and I just served soup, bread, bannock, Red River cinnamon buns, cheesecake, and fair trade coffee. That was really important to me. And it was, people liked it. I was so excited. I was using local ingredients, ingredients from the north. And then within about nine months, I needed a bigger space. So I had some help from Clarence Campo Development Fund and what was then called Aboriginal Business Development Canada. And I bought a, when real estate was like low, low price, bought an old 100-year-old building that used to be the pharmacy and turned it into a local foods restaurant. So that's the... First, it was mostly seniors, these Emma and Thelma. And then, yeah, then I started using these ingredients from that I'd grown up with, cranberry butter tart. I didn't want to throw out any of my coffee because coffee berries, cherries are picked by hand. And so I would save the coffee, like not from people's cups, obviously, but <laughs> like right now, if at the end of the day there was coffee left, I would save that, make a simple syrup, add cream cheese, and it was a mocha cream cheese icing. And that was the restaurant, local art, just a daily changing menu, some of the ingredients. And then I moved it to Saskatoon, sold the restaurant building, started a catering company, and then I was using even more ingredients from down here that I'd never heard of, like sour cherries. And So that's just some of the things that I've done with food. That's fiddlehead soup. Yeah, then that was that company. In between the restaurant in Saskatoon, I had to rent the curling rink in Birch Hills. That was fun. The seniors would see my car and just still come. And <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of different caterings happened. Went and cooked at a wild rice camp for a while. I have to tell you something interesting about the wild rice. So I was in um, New York City a couple a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go and give a presentation with another chef called Scott Eiserhoff. He has a company called Pipiscu, which means little sparrow, I believe, because he talked a lot as a kid. And um, we were able to present to the writers at Bon Appetit magazine, um, Architectural Digest, GQ, all these amazing publications. So we brought all our ingredients and we did our dishes. And I, we, I was in a hurry cooking, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to fry this rice to puff it in the deep fryer. And I tried and I tried, and there's no real reason why it shouldn't have worked, but it didn't. It just wouldn't puff. So I put it in the pan, and then I was like, oh, yeah, because the plant wants to do this. And it lays out like that, almost in a kaleidoscope pattern. Doesn't that look like moose fur or beaver fur? So I think that like a lot of these ingredients, they're not just, oh, I want to cook with this because it'll be cool. Like, the plant actually wants to be used in certain ways, and I think, like, for me, a lot of that knowledge was lost, but there are people that know about it, and I think I'm also open to, if I'm ever cooking something and someone says, I don't think you should be using that that way, that's all part of the, the journey and the learning, too. But I love that, and then it, then it worked perfectly, so. Um, this was, yeah, I went up and cooked during the forest fires in La Ronge, and Chief Tammy Cook Searson was across from where I was cooking at the Riverside Motel, and she had some pickerel left. So we made a pickerel lasagna. But I was going to tell you, like, that's a really good thing that, and you know pickerel, it doesn't taste fishy. So you can get almost any kid to try that. It was so good. Thankfully, we didn't have an alternative. Um, and then I do outdoor dinners at Wanuskewin Heritage Park outside and trying to get as many youth and teenagers to come along and help and experience that and get paid. I don't believe in exposure for <laughs> kids and artists. I like to pay them. There's a, there is a time and place for that, but I like to. That's a three sisters salad. Tamarack, have you ever eaten tamarack needles? You can make a tea out of them, but also if you fry them, it looks like a beard. It looks like a red-haired guy's beard, but it tastes better than what I think that would probably. <laughs> and it's nice if you're ever doing a fancy dinner, you can just put a hit of that on top of the. It turns almost like this color. How am I doing for time, Rachel? Or staff or anybody? Oh, no. OK, so I'm just going to tell you school food, school food, school food. OK, let's skip ahead. Um, fiddleheads, da-da-da. 
Um, so, yeah, this is some of the stuff I did for the health region. Well, that's our <laughs> putting the salt on. Um, yeah, that's my brother. Not sure why he's there. So these are some of the things we did for the hospital. So the first one, when I say we, I mean me. Um, testing the recipes and then actually being able to go into City Hospital and work with their amazing nutrition department. I couldn't believe I had choke cherries in the hospital. Like that was never, that would never have been allowed, right? Duck, the team was sorting through those tiny little, or sorry, rabbit bones to make our rabbits stew. So the first one is um, a turkey dinner, but for kids that can't swallow very well that have dysphagia. That's the, the cookie you ate yesterday. And then that's a different version of the Bannock Calzone. This is what you're having for lunch and snack. So the, in the middle, I find that kids really like color. And if they see something orange, they assume it's cheese. And then they love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying you have to trick kids, but you know how that is. It's, so it's a pickerel wrap. So I, this is what you're having for lunch, one of the things. I roast squash, mix it with cream cheese, just a little bit of seasonings, not much steam the, the pickerel, flake it, and I go through it like four times to make sure that there's no bones in it. And then you just kind of layer it and roll it up with greens, and there you go. The Saskatoon berry fruit leather you're gonna have for your afternoon snack. I don't have any special equipment. I just use a, I, I make a puree, and then um, add a little bit of oil so it doesn't crack, just a tiny bit. The only liquid is lemon juice and maple syrup. And then lay it out on a parchment lined pan, put it in the oven at, 200 and forget about it for the rest of the day and then roll it up. So you can do that with any berry. I find apple has more pectin, so it's a little easier to, to work with. Um, oh, we made a, like a pop tart. So this is a lot of what I do. If anybody ever wants to work with me remotely, I've done a turkey dinner training for like eight hours with a team where I just kind of, from where I am, I can cook with them alongside. It's kind of fun, mirror, mirror it. That's the rose hip puree, pickerel cakes, um, something for Boreal Heartland. I can't remember what. Oh, that's. Uh, yeah, so there we were doing a training where I was teaching Chenille to make these wild rice cinnamon buns from afar. So there's so many things. Like the pandemic was terrible, but it did allow us to realize that we can access in, like intelligence and, and talent from other people. This over here is a wild rice porridge. So it's with um, um, what the wild rice flour like we had in the pancakes. Just cook it up. The reason I added, um, the reason the pancakes are brown, I think I told some of you, if you cook wild rice with fl as a flour or a baking with it, it often turns gray and green. And that nobody really likes eating gray and green pancakes or <laughs> baking. So I add just a touch of cocoa powder to prevent that. Um, I do a lot of work with um, the uh, Mama Wichita Center at Scott Collegiate. They have a food and tourism pathway for grades 10, 11, 12. And a lot of times they don't even have to pay me because other organizations will say, we want an Indigenous themed dinner, like the Hotel Sask or the Ag, Indigenous Ag Summit at Agribition. And then I'll go to their teacher, who's an amazing person, Kelly Christofferson, and say, do you have room for me to come in and do some catering with the kids? And she's always said yes. And then I go in, we figure out the menu together. We, I bring in any like extra ingredients and then they help cook and then we serve it together and the kids get the credit because I bring them up on the stage and they get to see people enjoying the food. And then that organization pays me. So that's just another thing you might want to think of bringing in chefs that if people want something, and also, how many of your schools do catering? Nobody? I don't know if that's allowed or if that's a possibility, but this, this school really does well with it. And they're, all, they're in charge of whether they can or have the capacity or the time to do it. And it goes right back into their food program. And I believe the students get paid in like bus cards and you know things that they can spend that they need and that will really help them. And they get all the tips. This is a moose meat roulade. So I thought I was being super fancy, and then when the kids smelled it cooking, they're like, it smells like a Big Mac. And I'm like, no, it just has special sauce, onions, mustard, ketchup, beef. And I'm like, oh, crap, it is a Big Mac. <laughs> so, so we did use moose meat here. This was a feast that was just going back to the families. There was last year, so we were still pretty COVID-y. And we prepared everything at school, and then they were just going to heat and serve for their families. So we did use moose. 
and that's how it looked. The Labrador tea citrus vinaigrette. Yes, that's the executive chef at Hotel Sask. And he's talking to Devin Asaikin, who's now in law school, and then Taylor, the young woman on the left, she's actually full-time at Hotel Sask now because of that collaboration. So, and I just wanted to end with this because it just makes me so happy to be out picking things and then to be able to share them with folks like you. And, and I just hope that we can all get out there and renew our hearts, minds, and spirits whenever we can. Do we have any questions? <laughs> We're a little over time, so we'll take like three minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions for Jenny. And she'll be around all day today, so if you want to pick her noodle about <laughs> any of the wonderful things we've eaten or how to use some traditional ingredients, these kinds of things, please do. Um, no, I just operate right out of my home in Lumsden. I have, when I lived in Saskatoon, I taught at the local kitchen in Saskatoon. It was actually just on Avenue B South. So I just go wherever people want me to go. But I wouldn't be against people coming down and seeing me. I have a fire in the backyard. And my dream is to um, get some land and have a cooking school slash Airbnb, whatever. Preferably on the land that my great aunt would have had. <laughs> I'd love to learn from all of you, I think. The other thing I was going to say is that if you bring in chefs, or like, okay, I don't know how to say this without offending anybody, but you have so much knowledge as cooks and as people who are in your community, you know what grows there, you know what your community needs, you're the ultimate authority. If you bring anybody in for advice, stand firm with what you know and what you want to do. If you want to just use a bowl and a spoon for everything and someone wants you to get a $10,000 piece of equipment, just weigh that, that stuff out, right? But, I mean, it's, I'm always learning. I have no formal culinary training, but everywhere I go, I learn a million things from other chefs and from people that have their Red Seal and their CCC. But please remember that you know a lot. Any other questions? Any other questions? I have a weird little cookbook, but yeah. <laughs> um, I had a I had my laptop stolen from my car after well, I forgot to lock it, and I hadn't saved much of anything, so I went out and bought a 1949 typewriter and typed everything from memory and cut and pasted, literally had it printed here in Saskatoon and made about 700 copies, and then I sent one to Tom Hanks, found his address and typed him a letter, and he typed back two weeks later. So yes, I have a cookbook. Tom Hanks has it, but that, that was in 20... <laughs> you can phone him and get it back. I have a few left. Um, I would... Anything you want that you've had that you didn't get in your packet, I can get to you. I promise you I will get it to you before Christmas. Just give me... <laughs> just give me a dingle and I'll... Or we can figure out what you want. Pop it yeah. up onto the brilliant ideas. If, if there's any particular um, ideas that you have or questions... Throw it up there, and we'll make sure it gets to Jenny. Can I just share one quick more story? You're looking at me like, don't. But <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no, around getting kids to try new things. So I think it was in like 2011. I was invited to go up to Pine House to cook. So I left my restaurant at 3 in the morning. It was winter. Drove to Larange, Took a plane to Pine House. I had brought some ingredients, and then they had some amazing stuff there. And I wanted to do fish tacos. And at first, the kids were like, Ugh, and I'm like, we're going to do cranberry salsa and you know, ground pickerel and all this. And they weren't too excited. Some of them were. But because they were part of the process of making it, by the end, they were just like, I want to take some home to my sister and my mom. And so involving them in even a small part of the process kind of changes, changes that mindset, which you've probably noticed, too. Yeah. OK, well, anyone can come chat with Jenny afterwards. But thank you so much. And thanks for that last little story, because uh, we've heard a lot of questions, actually, about how do you handle some of these sort of resistance to new things. And, and I, I think that's a really good point. So and thank dips you very much. And bacon. Add bacon and dips. <laughs> Alrighty, 
That was terrific. Very always keen to hear such humble speakers like that. Um, and such a beautiful thing, the like acknowledgement of plant and and spirit, you know, and then like Dolores kind of alludes to that as well. And, you know, it's kind of like a very indigenous principle, this acknowledgement of the unseen realities. You know, reality is a very complex, holistic thing, and it's not a coincidence that we keep talking about it. Um, you know, just because we can't measure it, like empirically, doesn't mean it doesn't exist or doesn't influence us, we've influenced it, etc. all those sorts of things. It's uh, quite beautiful. I once heard an elder actually tell me that the, those are your five senses are another form of five distractions. They can just kind of get in the way of things from time to time.